Hey guys, here's a bit of supplementary material for the EM Smart Mopa Fiber Laser. First, thanks for the support in protesting the silly teardown embargo. But I didn't mean to send out a call to arms against the manufacturer. It was just meant as a warning for the regular viewers that they were about to watch a cookie cutter, low effort product review which would not be rewarded with a merciless teardown at the end. EM Smart was perfectly transparent with me about their condition, which they say they are only stipulating to honor agreements with their third party suppliers, not to hide away their internal construction. I agreed with that in advance because I wanted this delicious machine in my arsenal, so no hard feelings at all. I may have caught a little illicit peek under the hood of camera and found nothing offensive. They are using a DC to DC converter to turn the incoming single 24 volt supply into the plus minus 15 needed by the Galvo system and the plus 5 needed by the controller card. The controller card is a genuine JCZ one, which is good. I only found it a little bit perplexing that in this expensive product they chose a small, two axis light model of that controller. It only works with a special EasyCAD light software version with limited functionality. And it can never be extended with an additional rotary axis or a conveyor belt for a series production for example. EM Smart offers such options, you just have to specify it before purchasing, so that they give you the proper multi-axis controller card. After a few more weeks of use I found EasyCAD Lite a bit too crippled for my taste. So I finally pulled the trigger on a Lite Burn license. At the moment that cost 142 euro for a year of updates and I think you can use the latest software version that is released in a paid period forever. So that's a decent deal in my opinion, an insignificant amount of money in comparison to the price of the machine really. The Lightburn software package doesn't magically add another motion control access to the JCZ card, but it comes with all of the advanced features that I was missing in EasyCAD 2 Lite. Most importantly, automatic generation of these parameter test grids, which are crucial for finding the perfect settings for color engraving on stainless and titanium. This one for example tests pulse widths between 2 and 30 nanoseconds versus infill line spacings between 1 and 6 micrometer, resulting in a good variety of colors whose parameters can just be read off for reusing in the future. It's still tricky to utilize these colors correctly. I guess I just need a lot more hands on experience. For example what looked like a good juicy orange in the test grid turns out to be more like a straw yellow with lots of viewing angle dependence. It's not all about funny colorful surface oxide layers anyway. The most durable and therefore useful marking method is still good old ablation with strong impulses. And there were a lot of comments asking about this. Yes a MOPA source is of course great at generating nice and zappy impulses too with which one can remove surface treatments such as paint or anodizing. Or if all else fails, the surface itself. Let's try and shave off some copper oxide molecules from this 5 cent coin to combat inflation. Yep, that worked nicely with only a single pass. However, the circuit board question is a bit more tricky. Of course we can coat copper clad material with an edge resist layer. A bit of sharpie should suffice. Then we engrave that away selectively and use a chemical process to actually remove the exposed copper. This machine's high quality optics can expose much finer details than one can reliably utilize in a simple at home etching setup. And this is nothing new, it works with other pulsed laser engravers and even cheap blue diode machines. Direct copper ablation is also possible, but even more difficult. Copper is a great reflector for infrared wavelengths, remember? And a great thermal conductor, making this a challenge for the lowest power JPT MOPA source there is. EM Smart is using a YDFLP E20M7SR source in this machine. And with their recommended parameters of 80% power, 25 kHz frequency, 200 nanosecond pulse width and 1000 mm per second speed, I was not immediately able to chip away at a smooth copper surface. Although as you can see this sure is quite a high power setting. So what should I change? Which parameters will give me the most destructive power against a formidable enemy such as copper? I dug a little deeper into the product manual, where the relationship of pulse width and pulse rate is described in more detail. 
If I understand it correctly, the fiber laser's internal controller will try to achieve its programmed percentage of its nominal average output power within the limits set by pulse width and frequency. There is a maximum energy that can be stored in the gain medium fiber before spontaneous emission begins. So there's also an upper limit to the impulse power that can be produced. These black and white figures in an otherwise color PDF are quite remarkable. One can kinda tell that 20 nanoseconds seems to be the sweet spot where peak power is concerned. This didn't click in my brain right away. Are the doping ions looking into the future like OK Boys? I foresee that we only have a couple of nanoseconds left to relax, so better get rid of that extra energy post haste. Nah, I think it's actually the internal controller again, modulating not only the pulse width and frequency of the seed source, but also the power of that laser diode. If it triggers the population inversion with a larger seed impulse, of course the amplified outgoing pulse will also be taller. TLDR for maximum impact on our smooth copper surface, I would choose a 20 nanosecond pulse width at the lower end of the frequency range, so that we don't dump unnecessary heat into the workpiece. And yeah, that started to do something after a few minutes. But as before, this wouldn't be my first choice for PCB prototyping, only in the most dire circumstances. The smallest features tend to get scorched and delaminated unless you go really slowly, and the substrate below gets a nice conductive black sear, except if you get perfectly uniform material removal and are able to stop the process instantly when the copper is gone. Those are the usual process limitations. Technically, this machine will definitely structure circuit boards for you. The creation of precious metal nanoparticles is surprisingly straightforward, with a nanosecond impulse capable MOPA fiber laser source. You really just have to submerge a metallic victim in a solvent, and you're ready to get rich on dubious alternative medicine. Or if you can get your hands on some palladium, you can use the colloidal suspension to activate non-conductive surfaces in preparation for copper plating. Hmm, judging by the color, this is probably nickel. Here's a somewhat more trustworthy silver part, but also not terribly high quality. I think lower concentrations should start out at a bright yellow and not go straight to brown, so it's probably also some dirty alloy. We'll talk again about this once I find some palladium. Also important for PCB making and many other applications, the minimal focal point size and the beam profile. The beam is nearly perfectly round, as one would expect from such a costly fiber laser source. Under the microscope one can tell that my timing settings in light burn are slightly off. After some fine tuning and measuring with one of these microscope rulers, I would say the smallest focal point diameter I've achieved is around 70 to 80 micrometer. Good enough for most purposes, but there are F-theta lenses for the same working area and focal length that specify as little as 40 micrometer diameter spot sizes. Might be worth considering as an upgrade someday. The polar opposite of such micro engraving operations is of course also possible. I wouldn't necessarily recommend the cute desktop model if you're planning to do stuff like this most of the time. But it's certainly possible to leave some contact information on a bike if it ever gets stolen. Not that anybody would ever consider my beat up daily driver worth stealing. And that is all that I had wanted to add. Thank you for watching.